Well, it's Monday now, so Super Bowl 50 is in the books. Again, congratulations to the Denver Broncos and to the Carolina Panthers. So close, but too bad, so sad, not good enough. We'll see you next year. Um, I know I said after the Super Bowl I would do a four-round mock draft. Um, that's probably going to come next week. I was doing this mock draft, and you'll see it's still two rounds, and it's in the description box down below. I'll admit that this probably isn't my best work just from the very beginning. It doesn't mean that it's, I don't think it's terrible or anything. It was just one of these things I was playing out a little bit of a different scenario. In this particular case, maybe having one or two teams do something unexpected, having some players rise or fall, just playing out the scenario. It doesn't mean that it's what I think would happen or anything like that. Just a scenario that's playing out in this particular case. Um, going forward, though, you could probably count on these mock drafts coming each Monday. We'll call it Mock Draft Monday, whatever the hell you want to. So you can prepare yourself for that every week. You're wondering when the next mock draft is going to come up. It'll probably be Mondays, and I'll probably stick to that schedule as much as I possibly can. Now that the football season is officially over, for those of you also wondering, I'm really going to dive in heavily into the uh, scouting reports for prospects. I'm going to start with the biggest names on the defensive side of the ball. Then I'll come back to offense, go to the next level of defensive prospects, and so on and so forth. You know, the goal through all of this is to get somewhere between 100 to 200 prospect videos actually up. We'll see how many I actually get. It'll probably fall somewhere in that range. I'd like to get as close to 200 as possible, but it'll be at least 100 for sure, I think, when all is said and done. It may be closer to about 150, 160 or so. The biggest names, the most notable names. Um, but in terms of this particular mock draft, the first thing I will say is that in terms of the top 10, you've maybe got a couple of surprises there. Maybe a couple of them aren't surprises. In terms of the names, though, Tunsil, Wentz, Bosa, Ramsey, Jack, Buckner, Smith, Stanley, Elliott. These are guys that I expect to be top 10 or top 11 picks in this draft. So in the next couple of months, I don't expect there to be a ton, a ton of movement with these guys. There might be some change-ups here where this time I've got Joey Bosa going third to San Diego. Last time I would have DeForest Buckner going third to San Diego. I'll play out different things and see how it goes. But in general, you'll probably start to notice some consistency in terms of certain guys landing in certain spots or certain ranges in my mock drafts. And in terms of the top 10 or 11 You'll notice those names are starting to become common recurring themes, and I don't anticipate that changing a whole heck of a lot. Now, we've got the Senior Bowl done out of the way, and now we've started to hear, at least from the NFL draft media for what it's worth, some of the prospects that they think have risen, uh, some that might have hurt themselves. I'll talk quickly about some of the ones that I think helped themselves the most. Carson went from North Dakota State. I'm not surprised. It sounds like he helped himself quite a bit with his practice week, at least. Uh, you know, when it comes to pure upside, when it comes to pure talent, he is the number one quarterback in this draft. And I think that in terms of his makeup, both on the field and importantly off the field, he makes a world of sense for the Cleveland Browns at number two. Yes, it takes a lot of courage to draft a quarterback from North Dakota State number two overall. But, you know, just because a quarterback played at a big time program doesn't mean that he's a great fit for the NFL or going to be a great success at the NFL level either. And I think as more and more people start to pay more attention and start to uh, really hone in, they'll realize that Wentz is the best quarterback prospect on the board. A lot of people are talking about Noah Spence from Eastern Kentucky. If you remember him, he used to be at Ohio State until he got into some off-the-field trouble relating to drug use and possession. He got kicked off of the team, so he went down a level so he could play right away. And it would appear in theory, that he has helped his draft stock a lot. A lot of people look at the success of Von Miller in Super Bowl 50, look at the lack of quality 3-4 edge rushers in this draft, and they'll look at a guy like Noah Spence as being a guy that should see his draft stock skyrocket. However, the one qualifier I'll put on that is that a lot of it's going to come down to the interview process, especially at the Combine in private meetings with teams. And according to, I think it was WalterFootball.com, Spence didn't do that good of a job. In fact, a lot of people, a lot of scouts felt he bombed the interviews at the Senior Bowl. So you've got all those draft media talk about he's a top 10 pick. You could go top 5, top 6. You know, and they're not taking into, into account nearly enough the off-the-field crap. And that stuff matters. You know, talent is great. But if they have a question about your ability of availability and your question, your focus, dedication, and determination, and drive to get better and be a producer at the NFL level, it's going to hurt your draft stock. 
Now, to me at this moment, I haven't fully evaluated Noah Spence enough to know whether or not I think he's actually worthy of a top 10 pick or not. So I can't really speak from that place in terms of knowledge. I've watched him you know, sparingly, but I haven't watched him enough to make that full determination. When I do, you'll know, and then you'll know what I think about it. In terms of him going to Tampa at number nine, this is kind of one of these wild card picks. You know, I think he is a better fit based off of what I've seen for a 3-4 defense. Maybe Tampa would bring him in as a 4-3 strong side linebacker, and that could work. That could work because um, that's what Von Miller was early in his career. Uh, you know, Tampa had a hard time mocking somebody there at number nine because I don't know that any of the defensive backs are worth the ninth pick since Ramsey's already off the board going forward to Dallas in this case. Um, I just didn't think any of the corners were worth the ninth overall pick. I wasn't sure any of the other defensive ends were worth the ninth overall pick. Stanley's off the board, so off defensive tackle's not really worth. So it's like the Buccaneers at pick nine are in a place where I don't know if there's an ideal option for them. So that's who they kind of ended up with. Reggie Ragland from Alabama, it sounds like from all indications that he impressed a lot of people. I still think his draft range is somewhere between 11 to 20. And in this case, I've got him going to Chicago at number 11 in part because both Jack and Smith are already off the board. You know, Am I convinced that three inside linebackers are going to go in the top 20 picks? I'm getting closer to that. Do I think three inside linebackers will go in the top 11 picks? I don't know about that. But I think Raglan should feel pretty confident at this point in time because teams are going to view him as a little bit more athletic than they originally thought with a little more pass rush ability than what they thought. Somewhere between pick 11 in Chicago all the way to pick 20 with the Jets, somebody's going to fall in love with him, and he'll go there. I think he did help himself quite a bit at the senior goal. Vernon Butler from Louisiana Tech probably helped himself quite a bit. You know, playing at a smaller name program, and especially in this really good defensive tackle class, you had to do something to differentiate yourself because otherwise you can kind of get buried in the schmas. And who knows, when it comes to this defensive tackle and defensive line class, it is really deep. It's really top-heavy with a lot of quality talent. You're going to see some names drop out of round one, and you'll see some quality names even drop out of round two. That's going to be the nature of the beast. And I'll, I'll say that to anybody here that's going to sit there and say, there's no way this guy drops. There's no way this guy's going to go here. There's no way this guy's going to go there. We don't know. Not everybody can be a first-round pick. There are quality players that are still had on day two and day three of the draft. Some of these guys are going to drop. And some other guys you thought had no chance of being a first-round pick are going to end up being a first-round pick, I assure you and I guarantee you. And Braxton Miller, the wide receiver from Ohio State, you know, the best thing he could have done for his career was fully buy into and commit to his positional switch to wide receiver in 2015 at Ohio State because his performance at the Senior Bowl and what probably will come with another really good performance at the Combine probably will help make him a first-round pick. Like here, I've got him as the first pick in round number two uh, going to the Cleveland Browns, you know, but that might be the low range of where he could go. He might be the second or no more than third wide receiver taken. In this case, I have him as the third wide receiver taken in this draft. Uh, in terms of other notable names, you might be looking at me crazy, Laquan Treadwell being a second round pick. Hey, I'm going to tell you this much. The ability to separate is very important at the NFL level. And if Laquan Treadwell goes out there and runs a four, six something in the 40 at the combine, he's going to drop. And as a result, I think already that he's been one of those slightly overrated prospects by the draft media. I think he's a good talent. I think he has some number one wide receiver upside. I don't think he has big time number one wide receiver upside. He's just not as explosive as a Michael Thomas or a Corey Coleman. You know, even though I like Treadwell more than I like Michael Thomas, I'm just trying to envision again in terms of what I expect teams will favor, what teams will prefer. It doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with it or not. You'll also notice here that I've got the Houston Texans taking Christian Hackenberg at number 22, and I'll put it to you this way. Until the Texans get a quarterback, they're never going anywhere that's going to matter. And you already have the top three quarterbacks, Wentz, Goff, and Lynch are off the board, even though you might be surprised that Goff dropped to 13 at Philadelphia, but that's where, like I said, it was just a scenario that was playing out. But number 22, Houston, Christian Hackenberg. If Bill O'Brien is committed to him and Bill O'Brien feels like he could be that dude, you don't take chances. You don't wait till round two. You don't take another guy at 22 and then try to trade back up. You know, If you're that desperate and you're that committed to him and you believe in him that strong and you have him that highly rated to where you're afraid somebody else above you might take him, then you might even want to consider moving up a few picks to make sure you get your guy. The worst thing you could do, especially when it comes to the quarterback position, is go into a draft trying to get your guy, and then you don't get your guy. Ask the Philadelphia Eagles how that worked out last year when they didn't get Marcus Mariota. you got to get your guy. 
And to me, the Houston Texans, this screams of a perfect situation for all parties involved. Yes, I don't know that I view Christian Hackenberg as a first-round talent. I haven't made my full determination on him yet, but I don't think he's a first-round talent. But for the Houston Texans and the Houston Texans situation alone, and for Christian Hackenberg and Christian Hackenberg alone, I think this is a perfect marriage for the both of them, and it makes a world of sense. I think the Houston Texans are crazy if they don't take the guy at number 22. I personally think they're crazy if they don't take him here. And you'll probably see as we go further along in the mock draft process, I'm going to continue to be penciling in, if not penning in, Christian Hackenberg going 22 to the Texans. This is that moment in time where that's where I'm going, and I'm probably going to stick there. It doesn't mean that that's where he's going to go. That doesn't mean that's where he should go. But I think it's a possibility. And there are a lot of picks the Texans can make at number 22. Uh, but in terms of the picks that would be the best or make the most sense for them, Hackenberg there is right up at the top of the list. Uh, in terms of other picks, you know, if you want to ask me about them, go ahead in the comment section down below. I'll be back Monday with another um, Monday mock draft. Sometime this week I will also be doing an NFL draft QA, so make sure if you have some NFL draft related questions, you go to Twitter at the Jeff Schlegel is my Twitter handle and go ahead and fire away with your questions. Check out my picks, let me know what you think, and I'll see you later.